For those of you who know me, you know I can't wait for good things, right? And today is one of those very good things. My name is Michael Kennedy, and it is my great honor and privilege to be able to introduce today's speaker. But I first want to welcome all of you here, and also welcome all of you in video land, wherever that is, uh, because this is also being broadcast. <clears throat> and Pendleton Julian is an architect, a writer, and an educator whose work explores the interchange between culture, environment, and technology. Her day job is as a professor at Ohio State University, where she also served as the director of that university's architectural school. Prior to Ohio State, she was in our neighborhood at this place called Massachusetts Institute <laughs> of Technology for some 14 years as a tenured professor. Anne is an architect by training and has been a principal architect for three firms. Her projects have been many and various, but I am especially intrigued by her work on designing universities themselves. She has engaged the Asian University for Women in Bangladesh and is now working to develop a university in Kenya called the Jesuit University of East Africa. She is currently working with the president and others of Georgetown University and others means especially students, to envision the university in 2033. And that work exemplifies why I find her an inspiration. For she moves from architectural design, she moves beyond the brick and mortar to imagine and to create systems of action. Everyone in this room works to figure how knowledge networks might engage social and global transformations more thoughtfully, and how those transformations might become more knowledgeable. I can guarantee you that after today, all of those knowledge abilities will become superb. No pressure. <laughs> As I was writing Globalizing Knowledge, <clears throat> I began to have indirect and informal com communication with Anne and her co-author, John C. Lee Brown, who happens to be a graduate of Brown University. We were talking about this very subject. Typical of their generosity, generosity, they were so gracious as to allow me to see earlier versions of their volume and to allow me to cite their work in my own. I cited it as an exemplar of the kind of intellectuality we need to engage if we are to understand and work more effectively in the 21st century. I am a sociologist, and I'm comfortable remaining within my discipline. But I am moved when I find those beyond my discipline and even those beyond the social sciences, whose approaches to understanding and engaging social change ought to inform our discipline. I'm inspired when those conversations are unbound by discipline, when they are motivated by creativity and care, when they are undergirded by awareness and audacity and when they're imbued with a sensitivity to context and sufficient humility to listen deeply. Those qualities are evident in the manuscript that will soon be available, but it's also evident in Anne's way of being and her invitation to us to help imagine how to design within complex systems and on complex problems endemic to the 21st century. Her talk is entitled Design, Agency, and the Pragmatic Imagination. And it's presented already in imaginative fashion as a diptych. Please help me welcome Anne Pendleton Julian. Well, that's pretty wonderful. Um, 
So I decided to do something a little bit different uh, because I was challenged, I was given an either or um, assignment, which was you could either talk about the kind of intellectuality uh, that uh, Michael felt was endemic to the 21st century, that's how he characterized some of what he'd read, or you could talk about some of the projects and be very interested in the university. And I'm not an either or kind of girl, so it's always a both and. And so I decided that I would try to, well, I would give you a piece of both. So the first part, the first piece, and we'll break in between, the first piece will really look at the framework through which we developed the project of our book, which has been its own design problem. It's, it's, this is the fourth version of it. The other was soft published. Um, and based upon work that I've been doing, that JSB has been doing, and other friends of ours and people we've looked at, so their work but the second part will I want to talk show you some of the work we're doing around the university design for the 20 for 2033 uh, not the building but the models and the mechanisms and the things that actually drive the ecosystem or are part of the ecosystem if you will um, please be patient with me I haven't done this before and I'm sure there's way too much content so what we'll do is um, if uh, questions can be asked see this as an informal presentation at any point, stop me, ask questions, deviate, it, it's all a learning experience. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, with the first half, which is really looking at, oh, how do I, okay, got it. So this is the kind of intellectuality part of it, I hope. <laughs> I hope it meets up to your standards. Uh, but it always starts with a very personal experience because for me, body, intellect, emotions, they're all, I cannot separate them out. It's a problem. I was born with it. So it starts with the fact that um, I used to approach life ontologically the way many people do when they're younger, which is uh, life was a power boat. I'd like to say it was a steamship, but I was never that large in terms of power. But the idea that it was a power boat, I got out of school, I knew what I wanted to do. I had an architect's degree, I wanted to change the world, full speed ahead, and, and I was on my way. But uh, that only worked until the late uh, 20s when I really realized there were a lot of other power boats in the water, and there were some steamships and people much bigger than me. And I was caught up in all the anxiety of like, why am I not accomplishing everything I want to accomplish? This should happen. I had the plan. And I, I met a woman who was really, really wonderful at framing uh, things. She was actually uh, an astrologist, a really serious scientific astrologist. And she took a look at my chart. She says, you know, you really have to approach life much more like a sailboat. It's really, really important that you understand you can set your sights on something, but you really do have to tack with the current. You have to understand the wind. It's more complex than just turning the motor on and heading in that direction. I was in heaven. This worked wonderfully. I learned how to navigate the water, sometimes thrown off course, but the metaphor was very powerful for me because it was a different way of operating. It was much more successful. And that worked until about 1991. I began to realize this is not the situation we live in anymore. This is the situation that we're living in a white water world. This one is a moment I could, you can, you can sit above the water, you've got a really good view of what's going on, and you can begin to really understand how to navigate those waters. This is an interesting kind of metaphor, but more than a metaphor for me, it began to be a way to look at the world kind of analogically. The idea that finding oneself in an environment where everything's connected to everything else, all the particles of water connected to each other, an environment that is radically is, is rapidly changing around you and can go from stillness to white water very, very quickly. But even more importantly, we are an environment since the beginning of Mozilla, since the beginning of the internet, in which everything and, and the opening of kind of the world to each other and vulnerabilities, everything is radically contingent meaning that what you do depends upon what's around you, that the context is constantly changing, not as one factor, but as factors that influence other factors, influencing other factors, influencing other factors. From wind to water to temperature to the major flow of those streams above you to the kind of minor tributaries around you, and they're all interconnected. Okay, now I'm going to um, raise the screen, except I lost my screen. Can you raise the screen and turn off the projector? Okay. So what I want to do is 
try to unpack what all that means. And, and like many, many people, especially people of my generation, where you, you're, you're brought up still on rotary phones, right? I don't even know if you know what those are. Um, and, the, and was very much part of the first wave of the internet. The change around one is both exciting but perilous at the same time. And what became really, really interesting to me was when I began to understand why this was happening, and then began to think about how one might operate in the world, which really was the, the, the design project of Design Unbound. I met uh, David Ronfeld in, or I met his work, let's put it that way, probably in about 2010. David Ronfeld is a, one of the senior, was one of the senior political uh, scientists at the Rand Corporation. He was running the kind of international uh, international Studies Division of it. And David has a really amazing construct that when I understood it, there was, uh, there was a certain calm because he began to explain why the white water is the way it is and then we can unpack from there. His construct was the T-I-M-N framework. Has, have any of you heard of Ronfeld or the framework? Okay. Really little known part of it is because David got very ill and he had to remove himself from, from Rand and from work. But it's an amazing construct. It's a framework for understanding the evolution of societal form. It builds up on several other constructs. But it's, so it's, he calls it the T-I-M-N. It's the idea that societies evolve and have different forms based upon the way we communicate. So the first one's really easy. Of course, it's tribes. It's the idea that the first societal forms were tribal. They were based upon face-to-face -face communication. And therefore, there's only a certain amount of people that one has in their proximity for that face-to-face -face communication. So tribes being really much dependent upon face-to-face. -face. I won't say oral communication, because it doesn't have to be verbal. It can even be signage. It can be any number of things. It's not just about completely like things, so face-to-face -face communication. But that then over time, with the beginning of the written word, and I'm not talking about the printing press, but the ability to write things down, the church did it first, you begin to have the, the beginning of the institutional form developing, where society now, these are hierarchical in nature, things like the church, the army and the state, ultimately. This was about writing it down so you could now communicate with people that you didn't only see face to face and communicate in a way where you could actually give directives. So communicating turned to directives, turned to creating a hierarchical insti um, an institution. So this is really about the notion of writing. Of course, and we're hoping this isn't going through, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, of course, for once the printing press happened, this just escalated tremendously. But the interesting thing about David's model is that it's not about one replacing the other because institutions didn't replace tribes, but they aggregated. So you still had tribes in the system, but now you have institutions as well. The other really cool thing that he talks about, and this is what it makes it, takes it beyond some other people, is that as you evolve from one to the other, as the new affordances of writing happen, that begins to, to disrupt the first one, begins to create problems for, for the first form. But there are already problems in the system, like tribes are growing too big, or the feudal society needs X. So there are already problems in the system, which all of a sudden the new form and the new affordances begin to help solve for. So the affordances create problems, but problems are also affected or, or ameliorated by new affordances. So the idea is that these aggregate. So you have t tribes plus institutions. The third one is the notion of markets. And markets are really the be beginning of replacing. It's not as if the state went away, but the whole notion of supply and demand an exchange between in, in, individuals, which is supported by new infrastructure, highways, new mechanisms, the, the LLC, uh, the whole financial market, and the whole kind of new domain, if you will, or new of, of finance and economics. So the idea that in the late 18th century, there begins to be a serious understanding of the exchange, supply and demand, capitalism, et cetera, so that the market form begins to enter the system as well. So now you have tribes still exist, so we still have face-to-face -face institutes and markets. 
The last one you can probably guess is that you begin to have a new form now happening, which are networks. The idea that the internet is the affordance, and it's the same thing. You begin to have problems here that these new affordances are, and we can talk about what they are, but it's not so relevant at the moment. These new affordances help create communication. They help create a whole bunch of things, but it's also creating a disruption. David says, that the real difficulty we're seeing now, even more so than the in Industrial Revolution, is that um, we are moving from what he calls a triformist era into a quadriformist era. So it's more complicated, more complex, that's his point. But I will argue this and have with David, he's now a good friend of mine, that that's not the only thing that's happening. What's happening, what's interesting is that networks have nothing to do with the other three. These are things, this is not a thing. Meaning, if I want to scale a tribe, if I want, or tribal forms of society, institutions, markets, it's hard to do. These are scaling in and of themselves like wildfire. But even more interesting, I think, is not that we've gone from triformis to quadriformis with a new form that's different, is that really networks have completely transformed all of the others. Instead of face-to-face -face tribes, we have multiple identities. We have multiple cyber tribes. So tribes are even more important than they ever were before. All of your friends that belong to different groups, identity groups, and they may not know each other. Tribes are changing. They're more important before than before. Institutions are changing. The state is no longer just about top-down actors, but bottom-up as well. So networks are we're not losing the state, we're not losing the top-down, but we're beginning to negotiate a new relationship. So networks have completely are beginning to change this, and they're changing markets as well. We now have global markets, we have process chains, and not single entities. So this is an amazing, amazing construct to begin to understand. We are in a new world that has nothing to do with what's going on before. All of the things you're seeing in the system, whether it's open government, whether it's, uh, I mean, I have a slide, I'll go, I'm not gonna try and remember, I'll move through that in a minute. So this is really, really different. Well, it's, it's one thing to understand that. The next question is, how do you begin to do with it? And, and JSB and I maintain that we really need a new set, we need a new framework to even think in this world if we're gonna have agency on that world. And that new framework has to begin to develop out of some old ones. So we have already, I mean, there's the old Newtonian framework of the world where there's the idea that, that's supposed to be an apple tree, that there are fixed laws and those laws never change. And that if you can understand what those laws are, there are about four of them, then you can make decisions about the world because you can figure out what the world is doing and why it's doing it. Well, we knew a long time ago that that doesn't, isn't enough. And so they're late to the game, but there is the kind of Darwinian framework, a moving standing up, the Darwinian fr framework, which begins to recognize that there are processes. And if we can understand processes, we can understand non-fixed conditions, but evolving conditions. That's really interesting. And then there's the issue of the survival of the fittest, and there's all parts, all, all things to that. But this isn't enough because in Darwinism, which is very much what capitalism is, is built upon, you've got the idea of survival of the fittest, but there's an assumption that evolution will take us to a better state. And that if you merely understand the processes, you can begin to understand where we're going. It does not allow for serendipity and chance. We live in worlds in which chance creates major disruption without us knowing about it. The other thing it doesn't allow us to do is it doesn't really allow us to understand non-linear dynamics or systems that are not in equilibrium. So the one kind of... Um, I don't want to call it a domain, but it's a, a school of thought, it's a group of people, it's a development that we've had intellectually over about the past, I would say, 100 years now, is the ecology framework. The idea that if we can look at the world through a kind of third window, again, this is an or, this is and, apples still do fall down, um, we still do have the genetics 
and do understand how the individual sits within the context. But if we look at an ecological framework in which, I mean, ecology is a word we all throw around, we throw it around much too metaphorically. Ecology is the relationship, the interdependence of things to each other in their contexts and how all of those things begin to work together. So if we can look at things through an ecological window, we understand that things change and they're always changing, but they're not necessarily progressing in one direction. The fact that because these things are all interdependent, it's not one process linearly constructed that we can separate out from all the other processes. They're all attached to each other. Little things over here affect big things over here. And that becomes really, really very interesting because if you can begin to look at, and we can even go back later to the white water, the notion, well, we can talk about it now, the fact that on the surface it has one kind of construct, but if you begin to understand that the weather and temperature affects it, and you can study the weather and temperature, the amount of ice upstream, the literal geological construct or cons uh, uh, tectonics of the system. Once you begin to understand an ecological framework and that all those things are affecting it, it begins to become a different window to look on the world. All of a sudden, the way you begin to unpack any problem becomes a kind of different, a different construct. The, there's only one other aspect to this, and then it leads into the whole notion of imagination, is that what one thing we've begun to, to say is, as we've been working on different projects, or I've been working on different projects, this is fine, but where do you start? The, what I've, um, the idea that you might actually look at every problem or every environment or everything you want to through one of three or through three different registers begins to help. I can unpack a problem now through what we'll call the, the uh, material register. In other words, a material ecology. I can look at a problem, whether it's the, the poor little um, a deli penguin that I showed you on the beginning that's beginning to, to go extinct. I can look at it through a material lens. In other words, I can understand what food is it losing? What's the, uh, the salt content of the water that it's in? I can look at all of the material properties and begin to try to unpack the factors within that material ecology. But we are social creatures. All big problems are socio-technical in nature. So the notion that you can begin to unpack any situation through a register of social ecologies. And this is what, this is what TIMN begins to be a framework for. But I can also look at any problem or any environment through what I'm going to call a mental ecology. So this, this also includes, by the way, economics, the political lens. Um, the mental ecology, so if we go back to the definition, is the relationship of ideas to each other and to the contexts in which they sit. That may be at the scale of the individual, in other words, the ecology in my own head, if you will, but it's also within a society of individuals. So this is really where culture begins to fall. It's all about idea const uh, identity constructs. It's all about cultural constructs. It's about ideas. It's about political ideas. It's about how we exchange and move through that system. So Design Unbound, which is the book, oh, one more thing. Um, so what's interesting is in these, this world, the kind of mechanism that drives it is if you know the rules, you're set. If you study the physics, you're set. That's the way it works. You may not, I'm certainly, I was in astrophysics for many years before I went into architecture, could not get through quantum mechanics, which JSB will say, will, has said to me many times, but that's high school level physics. So it's very, very embarrassing. Um, but, but so not all of the rules are easy, but the idea is that this is what drives understanding of the system. <coughs> in Darwinism, if you can begin to understand the processes if you can understand the way the instruction set of DNA works with RNA, works with the chemistry of our body, works with the, the, then the context through time, in other words, the constraints that come down from, from the context, or in economics, if you understand supply and dem demand and evolution and, and the conflicts in there, you can, you can theoretically have agency in that system. But in this system, once you understand that it's not a linear future we're looking at, 
that it's not a known, that everything is contingent. You have to be able to say, what are the possibilities of the future, of what might happen? And what are the propensities in the system? In, in other words, my professor has a propensity to act a certain way. He has a tendency to act that way. That doesn't mean he will under all circumstances because it's contingent. There's no cause and effect, but there are propensities. That's always helpful, tendencies. Um, and there's the notion of context. So the way you can un both unpacking this because you're dealing with things you cannot know per se and then even imagining where it might go the only way is through the imagination how do I so what so agency through rules agency through processes agency through the imagination, and I'm not using the imagination lightly. I'm not using it as you would use creativity. I'm using it specifically as the image-making cognitive processes of our mind that we use even when we're reasoning, even when we're perceiving something new, all the way up to the kind of free play side of the imagination. But the imagination is no good to us unless it can be instrumentalized, unless it can be structured and called into being in a rigorous, or let me put it this way, in a rich textured way, not just flights of fancy. All through history, we've talked about, OK, there is reasoning, and then there's imagination. Artists do this, and scientists do that. The pragmatic imagination, which I won't go into much, but the, which is the single that's coming out in about six weeks, really looks at the fact that the imagination is cognitive activity, covert in nature, that's what distinguishes it from other cognition. Covert in nature that even works when we perceive something strange for the first time and have to wrestle with what does it mean. The only way is to say, I think I can imagine it means this. We call on images from the past to help us all the way through reasoning, through abductive logic, Sherlock Holmes, and then into the, the side of the, the spectrum, which is the more generative or poetic side, poetic in the, in the very ancient sense of calling forth new generative material. So the issue is that we still can use these for agency, and of course we need this, but in a contingent world, this is the most critical uh, uh, driver and a mechanism for agency, but only if we can put it to purpose and use it pragmatically as well as for just the play, which we like to do. Okay, so that's kind of the, the major construct, and now I'm going to go through a few more slides. Can we, see, I've lost my screen, so I can't control anything. If the um, screen could come down and the slides go back on. People are better than technology. You could actually talk to them and tell them what you want. Great. So I want to just run through a, a kind of slightly more organized <laughs> presentation of the situation, if you will. The interesting thing in this world is that, you know, threats spread more quickly and widely than ever before, which turn into new dangers when we try to regulate or control them. This is part of the whitewater world. Endemics, uh, flu, anything that starts somewhere else now because we're connected begins to affect us. In whitewater worlds, in complex systems, there are parts of it that cannot be modeled. The system is its own model. They can't be ironed out or removed. Physicists will call these irreducible unknowns. In other words, we can't reduce them down to parts that we might even know, right? We can know the parts if we could reduce them down. If we could say these are just the constraints and they're all affecting it, then we can know it. The issue is that 
often they're not even irreducible, they're novel, they're new. You know, the minute SARS hit, this was new, this was novel, it had not happened before. It's part of moving into this network society. Most of complex systems and things that happen are only understood in retrospect. That's fine if it's the end of something that you can reflect on, but the problem is, you know, you don't go home at night and the world stops around you. There's something new already in the morning. The interesting thing, the difficult thing, is that once a system tumbles off a ledge, once a species goes instinct, um, goes catastrophically bad, it is very hard to return it to its earlier state. Usually it is impossible. If you believe in Newtonian framework only, you just reverse the laws and it will begin to work. If you believe in Darwinism, well, it'll probably sort itself out since we're supposed to be evolving towards a better state. Um, or the, again, so this is a very, very different, a very different way. Um, this notion of being too late is part of it. It's really, so if we're going to study these systems, there's lots of incredibly valuable understanding. If we can really, and we do look at ec ecological systems to understand how they are resilient, how they even learn. But this is a different attitude because an ecologist will tell you, you have to let little forest fires burn or you will get in a situation where there's too much dry tinder and the entire forest will go up in flames and you will lose the system. This is a very, very different. So resilience in, in, a, in an ecological system is dependent upon small disruptions that the system learns how to recuperate from and then fills in differently. If a species goes extinct but there's another one that can take over some of the functions, it's a learning system. If once one begins to look at it this way, it's very, very different than than the way we think about putting out all the forest fires and even trying to avoid forest fires after there's been a catastrophic one. So it's a very, very different way of, of looking at the world that's extremely productive. Um, this is really an important understanding that complex environments are full of influences that run on different clocks. There are slow and fast variables. This is the beginning of an understanding of how you work on complex socio-technical problems. Not understanding that a drone that we send in that may even bag us six supposed terrorists that kills six civilians those six civilians have now been radicalized, their families have been radicalized, their tribes have been radicalized for three generations. Fast fixes, but causing much more trouble in a, in a kind of, in the long term, the slow variables. All systems work with rhythms of slow and fast variables, and that's part of it. And these are all principles that our, our book's been built upon. So how to work with and in complex systems, it starts with understanding and listening the system, reading the system, deep em empathy in the kind of literal sense, uh, even using the imagination to empathize, to walk in the shoes of the others. Um, yeah, I love this. Buddhist masters like to say that you, you really start with right view before you even think about right intention and then right actions. Uh, I'm not going to go through these because there are more words on the slide. Um, this is, but this is important. Uh, besides being great many factors, the catch-22 of all of these problems is that you cannot learn about the problem without working in the system, without trying solutions. It's when you try solutions and get the pushback from them that you begin to learn about them. But every solution you try has a lasting unintended consequences that are likely to spawn new complex problems. So again, the tool set really works with, this, with, with trying to deal with this understanding. How do you set up situation? Uh, how do you understand the boundaries of a system? How do you probe the system? We have all new tools today to listen without disrupting the system. If you wear a Fitbit to listen to the kind of ecosystem of your body, you know, unless it weighs 20 pounds, it's doing very little disruption, but it's getting a lot of information back. Social data mining, there's lots of ways that we can begin. We have whole new tools and affordances because of the N that are helping us out. So basically, this idea that the old operating frames are insufficient, 
We really need a new way to look at things today. That's the idea of this, this from Newtonian to Darwinian to the kind of third window. Um, JSB loves to use the, the um, story, not story, but the kind of analogy of the, the car versus or the, the clock versus the cloud. I like to use the Ferrari instead because there's a real difference between complicated and complex. A complicated thing like a Ferrari, so a clock is a simple thing that you can take apart and put back together. It's not dynamic. If you know what you're doing, it should work again. A Ferrari is complicated. It's a lot more work, but theoretically you can take it apart, break it down into its parts, and put it back together. It's an analogy for how you could work on a problem that's complicated. In a complex system, you can't take it apart. A weather system, a cloud structure, an ecosystem, a social ecosystem, ISIS, all of these things, you cannot break it down into parts, fix one or two, and put them back together. It's, it cannot be done because the system is always working in this interdependent way. So this is just a, so I talked about um, the three different registers, the social, the material, and the mental, interdependent. The issue is that we need new tools, methods, and mechanisms to work on these problems. The issue is we have new tools, <laughs> methods, and mechanisms, which I won't go into today. We're doing a great series at SSRC at the New York Public Library next. Um, in May, we're going to have a session just on new tools that work on these kinds of problems. We have people working in Syria doing amazing work with some of these new tools. And the, the issue of the imagination. So simply defined, imagination is the power of or capacity of humans to form internal images of objects and situations. These images may be visual images, they may be auditory images, or they may be motor images. My, my really good friend Antonio Damasio, who's a cognitive scientist who's worked in this area for years, um, he talks about how the imagination relies on banked images that one recalls, <coughs> brings them online, and then operates on them to create novel combinations. Banked images come from different places. They can come from the world outside, things that you've just banked and come back the way they are, or they can come from the inside world where you've already worked on that image and created something new that is, is completely your own. And the imagination with its propensity for playing with association creates new renditions all the time. It's that propensity to create associations that allows one to, to enter into very new territory. So I have four slides on the pragmatic imagination. I'm not going to go into too much. I'll give you enough, just um, only because really this was just finished about five days ago. Um, and so there's been no time to develop a, a real talk on it yet. Uh, but I figured I would try it out here a little bit since. So the pragmatic imagination. I will read it, I hate doing this, but I'm going to, is a concept that sees the imagination as a spectrum of coherent synthetic image making that runs from dealing with the known all the way to projecting the novel. It values the entire spectrum, but suggests that the last portion of the spectrum, the domain of the kind of, again, this is the, the Greek use of poetic, where it's about, it's not poetry, emotion, it's about generative. Things that you bring, what you bring new th things into being is what poesis is about, the poetic imagination. This part is necessary in a world that is rapidly changing and radically contingent. You have to imagine what could be. You have to imagine what, why it may be happening the way it is, and then begin to potentially test it out or move it forward. And finally, the pragmatic imagination it proposes catalyzing the imagination, calling it, setting it in motion, when you need it, not just, oh, I think I'll do something imaginative today. I think I'll paint a painting, right? No, really being able to call it into, uh, into uh, to scaffold it throughout an entire process and then instrumentalize the products of the imagination to actually put it to purpose, for pragmatic purposeness. So there are five principles. The first principle is just very simply that it is not about, and the, we go through the cognitive science behind this as well, we call on Vygotsky's work and the idea of the gap that begins to exist even in the smallest perception, but that it isn't anymore 
about perception versus reasoning, but that in perception we use the imagination, the image banking part of our brain, in reasoning, which is super interesting because deductive reasoning, it's kind of like perception. All the clues are there. You just got to figure it out. But we still need to fill in gaps. Inductive, where the clues are there, but you have to supply new ones. Abductive reasoning, which is I like to think of Sherlock Holmes, you know, where Sherlock Holmes would get all these facts. He'd be asked, um, do you have the solution? And he would say, or do you have the answer? And he'd say, well, I have five or seven. The notion that you imagine what it could be before you ever even begin to test it out. And even Sherlock Holmes, what's really wonderful in, in the Conan Doyle books is he has this one wonderful line where he said, so-and-so, which is the inspector who's supposed to be taking care of the, 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 the crime he's on, so-and-so would be a great detective if he had any imagination. The idea that abductive logic is about requires the imagination. That's where the shift occurs. And then, the, then speculation, using the imagination to speculate about the world, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the university project. Experimental, where you experiment off of your own creative history, and then free play imagination, which we tend to associate um, with uh, art and music and, and th those, those sides of it. So that's the first principle, that it's an entire spectrum of activity, all the way. We need to use it all the way. And that the second is this idea of minding the gap. This is actually when you see the whole build-up, it's better. But I, the, the idea that even in perception, there's a gap between what you see, what, what is obvious, but oftentimes what you see is unknown. If you see an American table, the first time you see a Japanese table, for instance, the first time I saw a Japanese table, you said, I, what is this thing that I'm perceiving? You don't necessarily go through the overt process, but you begin to fill in with how would you sit at the table, imagining how you might sit at the table, imagining all sorts of things. And then the idea that there's a moment at which the gap is not so much about sense making, but begins to become about sense breaking. Sherlock Holmes would break sense first. He wouldn't say, he wouldn't look at the absolute facts in front of him, but he would break the, what they seemed to mean and imagine something different. Speculation is the same thing. How do you break the sense to begin to understand uh, a new possibility? So that's number two. And then three through six uh, is really, are pretty simple. One is the idea of proactively imagining and, it, and we take a lot from pragmatic philosophy, but like everything else, which Michael will tell you, I don't do anything religiously because as a designer, we, we take permission to work provisionally and not academically. This is very, very different. It's not about creating the right answer, but about provisional possibilities that then by using them in action, you test them against the world as opposed to intellect the, the kind of the academics of it. I've, I've, done, I've done the academic. I've, um, it was never as satisfying as being able to stop at provisionally interesting and then testing it out. So given that, it's about pra proactively imagining the actual in light of meaningful, purposeful possibilities. Everything in reality has a, a possible use and seeing the opportunity in everything. This idea that thought and action in, prag in the pragmatic imagination are indivisible and re reciprocal. So the imagination is part of all cognitive activity related to thinking and doing, and thinking and doing feeds back to the imagination cognitive activity. And that the generative side of the, uh, the generative, poetic, sometimes disruptive side of the spectrum is especially critical in a world that requires radically new visions, actions, ideas, even radical empathy requires you to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Imagine yourself as them, not just listen to what they say. The imagination must be instrumentalized to turn ideas into action. And fifth, a sixth, that uh, setting oneself in motion is critical to this. It's not about waiting for the brilliant idea to come. It's what kind of equity do you put into the system so that you prime the brain to do that covert activity, which it will do as human beings. It's just what we do. So it's, it's about that. OK. Um, it's really about imagination leading to action. The only other thing is, so this is, to, so the, this is the single that's coming out. 
um, in about six weeks. We decided to do this just as you know, you often release a single from an album to have conversations around it before the album comes out. This is, this is Bob Dylan, one of my favorites, to dance beneath the diamond sky with one hand waving free. This is a song about the imagination. So just like a single released before an album, we're releasing this before Design Unbound. Design Unbound is a five book book in which it's, uh, there are 10 tools and two meta tools uh, to begin, and this is, this, is the intellect, this is the intellectualization, is that your word? <laughs> that creates the, I like that word, that creates the framework that we realize, so this, this has been four books because actually all of this thinking developed as we were working on, on these different projects and on even what the tools were that we were using. Um, so it's called Designing for Emergence in a Whitewater World. You have to design for emergence, not strategic plans. You have to design things that put in the system to shape the context. Um, so it's five books. The, each of the books, so there's a, a full arc to the whole thing, but each of the books we feel is probably geared towards a different audience. Uh, also, people don't read the way they used to read anymore. So instead of a 500-page book or 600-page, which is really more of a textbook, it's turned out, the idea of having 100 pages to read at a time. I don't know about you, but I'm reading six books at a time. Do not, I can't do the read a 400-page novel anymore. Terra Nostra is just off my table at the moment, right? Um, the, so we're reading in a much more particulate way, which is really good because there's serendipitous connections we make, so that's part of why. So this is book one, Architecture Unbound. These are the chapters. Um, these are the tools that exist in Architecture Unbound. These tools are coming from architecture, which uh, I think I ex I'll explain in the next talk why we're starting in architecture, or maybe now. Um, this is the second book. It's called Designing for Emergence. There's each of the, these books of three chapters start with the kind of theoretical, conceptual, philosophical uh, lens, which you cannot read if you don't want to. This one's about a tool, how do you really understand emergence, and then how do you design for emergence. <coughs> Book three is Ecologies of Action. World building, which we used in our studios, is the tool. This is a meta tool. A meta tool is a tool that aggregates a lot of other tools together. These are about creating true change in systems, um, in social, technical, social systems. They are, um, and again, they're coming from both projects we've done and other things. It's not engineering. It's not social engineering. It's about how do you transform the system from inside of it. Book four, Ecologies of Influence. Um, this is Networks of Intimacies, uh, uh, which was very much um, influenced by the movie ba Babel. And then Understanding Networks is a tool, and then the, no, the next meta tool is the change triangle. And in that one, we actually unpack, uh, I've become good friends with Stanley uh, McChrystal, we unpack how Stanley was able to completely overhaul JSOC. If there's, if there's no more hierarchical, bureauc bureaucratic organization, he was able to transform JSOC in action in Afghanistan to take it from uh, a basically a hierarchical structure to create a network, a network of networks is what he did. Um, and the fifth book is Intervals of Possibilities, the tool, uh, the pragmatic imagination in our epilogue. So just coming back to, to my favorite. The, the idea being that if you truly look through an ecological lens, this can move from a metaphor to an analogy. You can begin to really understand how the species in the water, the geology of the place, the weather systems, the amount of rain that fall, you can begin to to really uh, anticipate or understand some of the underpinnings. But the only way to work in a complex system is like the kayaker, which is to get into the system. You have to work in the system by being in the system. You have to have great tools, kayak and paddle, but it's using those tools that actually give you information of the system back. It's the way that the paddle sits in the water that gives you information of what's going on below the surface in a way that, that you can't get otherwise. So as an analogy, this is still full of rich kind of uh, things to unpack for me. Um, but again, as an analogy, not just a metaphor that one leaves kind of on the table as, oh, that's kind of cute. So I'm done with the first talk, but I can take questions. Thank you, Anne. Yes. Um, I know that you're going to provide examples through the Arizona University mm -hmm. later, but 
I was just wondering if maybe you could share a couple other, you know, just one other example of this creating change from the system, maybe from the Syria projects that you mentioned? Um, so the Syria is more of a tool. Mm -hmm. I can, um, let me try to think. So, yes, the easiest one to use is, is short enough as well, which is how, uh, so the, the meta tool system of action came about by finding this, this one thing. Um, do any of you know Jose Antonio Breo, Venezuelan Youth Orchestra, or the Philharmonic, LA Philharmonic? Um, so Antonio, Jose Antonio Breo, and he's won several awards for this in the 1970s. Um, Venezuelan, he's also a political scientist, an economist as well as a musician, and he decided he wanted to work on one of the most intractable problems of Venezuelan society, which is they lose all of their children, their marginalized children, to the streets. Right? The girls at nine are prostituting. If their health holds out, yeah, seriously. Um, if their health holds out, you know, when they're in their 20s, a lot of them are, are emotionally destroyed, if not physically destroyed. The boys are drug mules, nine, ten years old. Uh, if they're lucky, upward mobility when you're a nine-year-old in these situations, boy, is that you become a drug dealer and hopefully live into your 20s, right? Losing so many children. So he started uh, with 11 kids in a garage, the idea of creating an orchestra, not just teaching music. I mean, everybody knows that mu music does a lot of amazing things. It teaches you focus, it teaches you discipline, um, sensibility, all these kinds of things. But no, he, he set out to build orchestras and to build choirs with the assumption that if you were together with a group of other people, you had to listen to each other, you had to become part of a community. But then he built a whole system around it. The system consists of a school. So first thing is get them off the streets, make them safe. So they would come home after school and they would go to Elsie Stemma, which was a music school, to build these orchestras. Um, but the parents would be involved because they'd have to drop the kids off and they had to wear white shirts. So the parents were always ironing and washing these white shirts <coughs> for their kids. So the parents were involved as well. Um, over time now, he, they have saved over half a million kids from this kind of deplorable future. And the reason is because the kids, in addition to learning music, wearing white shirts, being safe and off the streets, sitting together, working together, began to develop ambition. Because it was not just about, this is babysitting with music, right? It was about excellence of orchestras. It was about the excellence of choirs. So they develop ambition. Their parents develop ambition. They have performances. All the parents come. Their towns began to develop ambition. They would even translate the music, uh, the, the vernacular music from that region or that town into things that they would play or that they would sing. And it consisted of a series of simple actions or mechanisms. It was the idea of the school. It was the white shirts. It was the fact that even at four years old, they have what's called the paper orchestra. So these kids, and I wish I had a photograph. Maybe I'll find it for you later. Um, so these kids at four years old, they're sitting there with paper instruments completely detailed to their scale. So they're watching the director, and they're plucking the instrument or playing the flute, whatever they're doing. So they are developing the actual practice of, of an orchestra. Um, other, other amazing mechanisms, but it's also about adaptability. So he created the basic template, but every community would, would actually take it and apply it in their own way. Really very interesting. He also, oh, one of the most amazing mechanisms, this is the photograph I'll, I'll try to find for you. Um, he at one point said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with the children that are not only marginalized, they're deaf and they can't speak. And everyone said, you're absolutely crazy. And, and so he developed the mechanism of the idea of the white glove choir. So the kids get up there, and they pull on these white gloves. And the orchestra has their director. They have their director. And they're watching this woman or man do all these kind of signs, with the, do all these things with their hands. It's not just signing. It's literally translating the tone and the rhythm of the music into the, into the, the movements. Uh, there's this, they've been all over the world this White Gloves Choir. There's this one woman, one little girl, she was 14 when she was interviewed, and she said, um, I pull on these white gloves, and it's like my hands are birds in flight. She said this because she learned to speak. The ambition that she had, had, that had been catalyzed in her by being cared for in a group with other people 
that are deaf and unable to speak. She said, I need to speak. And she taught herself to speak. So it's the idea that creating, and so a system of action actually has five components to it. There's the idea of the vision. You have to have the vision. You have to have the concept. So the vision was to, in this case, was to work on one of the most intractable problems of Venezuelan society. Venezuela still has its political problems. It still has its economic problems. But half a million kids have been saved. Um, and internationally, there are whole new groups of this as well. So the vision was that. The vehicle was music. But the concept was orchestras. That was a big deal, right? And then there are all these mechanisms. That's the fourth component. What are the mechanisms? What are the system of actions and things you can put into the, in, in to the system that changes the context for these kids so the outcome is different than what it would be? You're shaping a different future by affecting the context around the kids. That's what a system of action does. The fifth thing, which you have to do, especially with this notion of pragmatism, is you have to really have a network of partners. You can't do this alone. Part of the reason that Obreu was so successful is because as an economist, he knew how to work with, he knew that he needed the government on his side, so he got them on his side. He knew he even needed the corrupt government on the side. There's no room for a kind of idealism. You're corrupt. I'm not going to work with you. Huh? Right? He needed to have the parents on his side. He needed to have the businesses and the philanthropists on his side. So he worked all of those as well. So there are five components to the system of action. And that's just unpacking one of them. I used this when I did the Asian University for Women. I didn't know I was doing it. It was the first project in which I was doing more than architecture and being pulled into more and more than architecture, including fundraising, uh, which was beginning to build a network around me. Um, so it was, the, it was, for me, that was the hinge project where I went from doing stuff to doing more than stuff. You know, we started on the master plan, but we did more than stuff. Um, design unbound is really about being unbound from thingness. You don't have to just do thingness. I still do thingness. I like doing thingness a lot. Um, and unbound from disciplinary boundaries. And then I'll come there. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. So the, uh, the whitewater metaphor is, is interesting. It, um, it strikes me that whitewater is both simul it's simultaneously exhilarating and exhausting yes. going through this. And uh, that, that kayaker uh, won't last very long. It's not sustainable. I mean, how, uh, how does one navigate through this? combination of exhilaration and exhaustion in such a way that we actually get to the other end with solutions. Yeah, and, and the, the analogy is important for me because then you, once you begin to, un once I discovered TIMN and began to then start unpacking things through ecology theory, things became so much calmer for me, you know, because I could begin to see more than I could see before. But any whitewater kayaker, there are lots of you see the exhilarating because that's what they film, but actually most of the river is pretty calm, right? And I have, I don't know if this was one of them, you see where they fall and they turn over and then they roll back up and they turn over and they roll back up. I'm in agreement with you, it's exhilarating and exhausting. I think I'm merely saying this is the world we're in, so sometimes you have to make eddies and find eddies. In fact, intervals of possibility is a, is a tool which is about how you literally carve out slow spaces so you have time to listen to what's around you, at the very least, and actually, uh, better yet, to create systems of action and things like that. So, unfortunately, it's what we're in right now. The question is, how do we navigate it? So we, we're, and a whitewater kayaker only goes into the little water at the beginning, right? You, you, because you can only learn about it by being in it, you first of all have to go in with good muscles, skills, good tools, so that's, and education is about getting a lot of that stuff under us. But I would suggest that education is not really getting us ready for the white water. And is it conceivable that there's a level of abstraction or complexity beyond the white water? I mean, here we are in Space history. travel, but I'm not going to go there. Don't do no, that okay. to me, please. <laughs> no. You had a question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was curious. I, I, um, uh, have you read uh, like Manuel de Landa? Of course. Right? Yeah, I, of course. I, I saw so much of a parallel between. Yes, of your course. He's been three. very influential. He's okay. one of the people been very influential. Yeah, I was curious because I read his book Thousand Years yeah, on Native History, and it seems like he takes very much like kind of a mimetic theory uh, approach to those three like uh, geologic, biologic, cultural um, views. 
And I'm curious if you see that kind of framework, which maybe has more trust in like a Darwinian process, it, does that fit, fit into your mechanism? hundred percent. The beautiful thing about Manuel Delanda, if you talk about viruses, those are fast, fast dynamics. If you talk about geological structure, it's slow dynamics. But it is the fact that I think we're a generation, because Manuel is my age a little bit a tad younger, we're a generation that have come through a whole different paradigm and you know, then, and I was at MIT when it started. I was at, at MIT when OpenCourseWare started. I was at MIT when email started, right? So it's a generation that has reflected and, bego and begun to, I think, understand. Um, but, but I think, for me, Manuel is a little bit still on the Darwinian side, a lot on the Darwinian side. Um, and I was saying to Michael, I fell into this ecology because as, a, as an architect, I've always been interested in landscape architecture, but not making gardens. And in my, my span as both student and then uh, practitioner, uh, the field of landscape architecture has gone from designing gardens to thinking about ecological processes. And because I was naturally there anyways, I kind of was going with that tide. So this is a natural way for me to think. It just, it just so, so I was doing, like the Asian University for Women, I was doing this before I knew what I was doing because it was inherent to, to a propensity I had. Yeah. Um, in the example that you're giving about um, the musicians, mm -hmm. um, it seems like the system created there is wrapped up in a lot of respectability politics, that like there is prestige in performing an orchestra, the wearing of a white shirt, the idea yes. that uh, dedication and focus would keep you from degrading your community, quote unquote, or um, that being the only reason why you might participate in sex work or otherwise be in a violent situation. And I, I wouldn't, it doesn't sound like it's not making change. I think it's changing so many universes because every person is a universe and it's helped right. millions of children, you said. But I wonder if by not engaging with the external forces and only focusing on internal development, if it actually reinforces these systems that might place people in precarious situations in the first place. So this is a phenomenal question, seriously phenomenal, because in a pragmatic vein, um, it's a question of h how much can you do, how quickly, how, how much radical change can you make explicitly and how much does it have to be in a more covert way. In other words, what do you accept in the system? And now you could go to, through the whole argument that nothing is benign. You could completely make that argument. But as someone who was interested in being effective and having agency, the accepting of certain norms and givens because he knew, I'm assuming he knew he couldn't change that in his lifetime and affect so many children. So there's, I think there's two parts to it, and I think it's part of a balance that we all go through when we're interested in agency. What, what creates the, and I don't want to get into the greatest good for the, um, and again, I will, I will also say as a designer, um, a designer who likes to think a lot about these issues, I myself tend to move to the side of can we create amazing models where possibly the first steps we take are done in a semi-covert way, creating so much change that now it becomes a force that can't be denied. And that pulls along possibly a little later <laughs> the, the other changes that you want to make. This is a big issue with the university. Even when we starting the Kenya project, brand new university, all the rhetoric, we want to leapfrog everything, right? But what are they doing? They're asking a university in Paris to build their engineering school. <laughs> They're asking Georgetown to bring in and co-opt their, their business school. So the, we are having to find a way, how do we create really radical things that don't sound so radical, have enough tradition in them still that we can, uh, we can get it done. We can get the funding, we can get the people on board. With the real belief that as it moves along, so um, we're, we're now talking about the university, but Michael Crow, when he started ASU, all the transformations at ASU, was the bad guy, a cowboy with no hat, all hat, no horse, tremendously was really moving outside of, even though he was doing very small incremental change that's now creating major impact. After 10 years, he has now changed the conversation. But for 10 years, not only could he not change the conversation, he had to take all the tomatoes. And there were some pretty mean, nasty 
p tomatoes with, with um, razor blades in them. So it's this notion of how do you think slow variables and fast variables, and how do you, how do you play them off each other? <coughs> yeah. Um, oh, oh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Smith, Julian, thank yeah. you so much for sharing this with us. Um, I have this honor to read the two chapters of your book, mm -hmm. and uh, I major in mathematics and minor in physics. So as you can imagine, I'm really interested in this kind of systems and the relations between human being and uh, the world. Um, the other reason I mentioned my major is to use it as a lame excuse for my broken English, and when I will try to explain myself as clear as I can. Um, I want to begin with uh, chapter two because you mentioned the reductionism. Through my learning, my professor always told us when when you face the when you are confronted with the huge problem, the first thing you do is not to is mm -hmm. to not give up and try to uh, separate, separate, keep separating it until uh, you get some um, basic problems that you can work with. And uh, through my experience, I think it really works. So um, I know in this book you try to present this new set tool um, of problems uh, of designing within the complex problems, uh, kind of like uh, in a world we expect it to be increasingly more complex and more connected. But the pro um, but the problem is that most of us, when we are confronted with this kind of huge problem. Our first instinct is to be of any help, mm -hmm. but our second thought is that there's no point, mm -hmm. that our contribution could be um, like a drop in the bucket and the bucket probably leaks. So, I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just want your, your English is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was a joke. Sorry, that was a joke. That was not. A <laughs> Um, so I just wonder, what do you think about this kind of okay, that's not mine. I turned my yeah. reductionism okay. to this kind of more and more com complex word? Mm -hmm. What's the relationship between this? And because the orchestra, you mentioned, this is a great, great program. I was so touched by the, all the differences it made. Uh, at all levels of the individual, of the family, of the community. But, <coughs> but at first, when I look at its origin, it's kind of like it's a make-do plan, make -do plan to kind of to, to the solution to the lack of real instrument. And uh, the musician, at first, his intention is to share his love of music to the group of students. So, just like, but it's kind of like... Okay, don't keep view. asking more questions, because oh, I won't okay. remember. <laughs> but it's uh, like, uh, it's just a small beginning, but we work on it. So it's kind of mm -hmm. a reductionism, but you can just bring the more complex problems into that. So the, so. the, the issue is that, um, and I want to come back a little bit to Abreu too, because I'm not sure I answered your question in, in uh, satisfactory. Um, complicated and complex are different. A complicated problem you can break apart. And if you find the place at which the most danger is or the most opportunity is, you can work on that and put it back together. You can do that. Complex problems, you cannot do that because you cannot see. You can't break it apart because you don't know what all the parts are. If I have a Ferrari, which is comp if I have a bicycle, which is not complicated, that's a simple problem, right? It has a fixed number of pieces, and there's the frame that does one thing. It's a frame that's the structural system. There's the mechanical system, etc. Same thing with the Ferrari. It has a fixed number of pieces. It has a fixed number of functions. It may be doing double duty, especially BMWs. But actually, I should use a BMW because it's no longer a car. But anyways, it's a, a fixed number of pieces and relationships and systems and defined relationships between them. In a complex problem, you have no idea what all the parts are. Only as things begin to unfold do different, different um, uh, relationships and exchanges begin to come apart. So I'm completely in agreement with your professors on complicated problems. A lot of people will use the word complex systems when they really mean complicated 
problems. And the beautiful thing is a simple problem is easy. You only have a few agents in the system or a few parts, and you probably only have one or two disciplines or domains implicated. You get the right people in, they can fix it. A complicated problem, more agents, more systems, more domains, but again, you get all the right people in, you can probably, it'll take you longer, but you can probably get to a good solution in the manner that you just, any good engineering is about complex problem. The agents, they multiply, they change, they change their relationships. You lose agents, others move in. This is what we're seeing in the kind of political landscape that we're inside of. You cannot know the, all, of, all of those things. Can I go to this side? And I will, yeah. So I'd like to ask a little bit, uh, I have two questions. Yeah. This one sort of following up on the first. When you mentioned, right, you, you can't, whenever you design a solution to a, to a complex problem, the system will respond in some sort of you know, aspect or some way. And so implementing the solution generally creates maybe some other problem, right? Absolutely. Because the system itself is inherently dynamic. Um, so my, question, my first question is, do you feel like, you know, like one of the greatest things with the digital age is simulation and prob you know, probabilistic with, with, with models. With what? Simulations. Okay, yeah. Simulations and probabilistic models, mm -hmm. which obviously, you know, are more accurate for, for uh, scientific sort of related uh, systems and less so for, you know, social systems. but. Right. You know, my question to you is, is do you feel like um, these models and these, these simulations and the act of uh, experimentally trying out these solutions in a fabricated, um, you know, in a, a fabricated system, like that's worth effort? Do you think that's worth time or energy into, into prioritizing that as opposed to, you know, understanding the, all the inter, you know, interconnected uh, faces and vertices of, of the, system, the actual system uh, to a case-by-case to case scenario. So there's two parts to that. One is that, um, so, and I have another little story that's actually a simple little story. The issue with um, complex systems is you can't design anything to implement. There is a very, and we talk about in the book, there's a very clear way to work on them. Um, well, let me go back to, to just simply answering. Yes, I think it is worth one's time. The issue is you cannot in any way model a complex system. You can approximate it, but you cannot model it because the system is the model. If any of you have read Borges' story about mapping, where they kept adding more detail to the map of this one terrain that they ended up having to make a map that was the size of the original, right? That's really, seriously, this is, this is what it's about. It is. But it's worth the work because before you go do something that may go terribly wrong, if you can get some good approximations and try them out, at least you have more knowledge than before you went in to do it, right? But the way to work on complex systems, complex problems, is working on it. And, and there's three things you can do. You first want to look at the boundaries. And by changing the boundaries, you change the problem. If I'm working on education as a complex problem and I decide I want to take on K through 24 years old, it's one problem. If I say it's K through 12, it's a completely different problem. The emotional structure, the people, all of that. If I say I want to look at first grade, in fact, we did one thing with Maine where we're saying, if you do first, fourth, and eighth grade, you will have more impact than if you do the full system, right? So even as you're working on it, you may change your boundaries. You, you start with a provisional. You don't make decisions. You provisionally do your best guess, abductive logic, right? And then you begin to work on it. The second thing is you put probes into the system. You begin to try to listen to the system from the inside. In the old days, the social sciences, that meant that you would go out with a survey. But going out with the survey was probably designed on what you thought the answer was going to be. But we now have ways of listening where you can, can actually listen to what's going on. You can data mine all the social, and you can begin to understand what's going on without affecting the system as drastically. But even doing that, you're going to affect the system, right? So the, the probe is always a little bit of a modulator. And then you do modulators. You put things into the system, and you see how the system reacts. What was an amazing, amazing story. I'm going to get all my names wrong, but one of the last generals of the, the Israeli Secret Service, and I'm forgetting his name right now, was the first general to actually live out an entire, not live out, but survive an entire prescribed term. And he was the only one that ever had any success because what he did is he did things like he wanted to understand what was happening with, um, uh, wasn't the, t uh, trying to f remember who was the, the actual group, it was a smaller group that he was looking at. So he decided what he would do is he would very discreetly affect this, perturb the system in a place that they wouldn't notice. So instead of like dropping bombs on them and seeing where they scatter, he said, let me just go and steal some of their supplies. 
Let me steal the supplies from this ship when it comes in, and let me do it routinely for about once a month for about six months, four months, whatever he did. And all of a sudden, he would watch what happened when he stole the supplies. What was critical to an entire chain of events, he was able to watch. So he was probing the system by modulate, by putting something into the system as well. And it was the way he began to understand the dynamics of the system, and he could begin to create, I don't know what he did back, because that's classified. That's the only part of the story I know. OK. Um, so my second question sort of falls up on that, because it seems like you know, the best way to design a solution for any system is to understand the context, right? Uh, you know, the variables, and, and it, it appears like the, the experts, right, or the, the ones who have the most expertise are the agents involved in that system directly, right? The ones who are living out that system and yes. being affected. So, I kind of want to relate this, like, I don't know if you know of MIT Media, uh, MIT D Lab, yeah. Development Lab, right? Very well. So, like, they seem to sort of tackle that, that issue with this idea that let's empower local agents with this idea of, okay, we're going to teach you techniques and tools and, and certain mechanisms which you can then use how you best see fit to affect your desired needs in, in your system. Right. Um, and this becomes like a very localized, contextualized, but a, a large scale adoption. Um, do you feel like this is something that is like successful and, and maybe should be looked more toward the future? Or do you think it has a cause? If, cause? if you're working on a system, the key is to work with the agents in the system. I can't agree with it enough. I'm doing a lot of projects now where I'm helping people world build their, their future. I'm working with the Defense Department. I'm working with Singapore. I'm working with RAND Corporation. But I can't do it if I don't have the experts in the system. They're the ones. So my role is to help them with all of these tools get to a certain place. But the one thing I want to follow up is that most of what's going in with the D-Lab and the whole social, we were talking about this at lunch, the whole social entrepreneurialism um, um, wave, if you will, which is an amazing, amazing thing. But much of it um, is, is uh, intent driven, motivation driven. And then the question is, what are the tools that one actually has to do this work. So the difference, I think, between, um, I mean, if another graduate says, I've, I'm the CEO of a social entrepreneurial company that's helping make new water pumps in Africa, right? It, it's just this, this notion. And then you say, are you an engineer? No. Um, do you know about water? N no. Um, do you know how to do conflict resolution? What is that? Right, so this idea that to do this work, even the D-Lab, all of them, the, there are really, I think there are skills associated with it that one has to know. I'm not saying it's a profession per se, but it's certainly there's, there is a body of knowledge to make it successful. And to answer your question more directly, I believe that body of knowledge should include the capacity to understand complex systems. Because a lot of the work that's being done, even really good work, is still very tactical in nature. Strategic at best. But where, if you want sustained capacity building, it really is about systems of action where you're designing for emergent futures, not, not in addition to creating incremental good change now. Right, so it's it's the two things together. So do you not so like when you're saying emergent futures, do you mean the, the emergent future? Like they sort of have to predict how that future changes from you know, the local people, the local residents, they're empowering themselves or No, it's it's very much like when uh, Abreu started what he did or what I was doing with the AUW. You can't foresee the future, but you know what? We are building our futures with every decision we make today. So instead of saying, let's foresee and change it, you actually, and this is what we're doing with the university, you want to world build the future you want. And then you ask, once I've world built this future, I've designed, I've imagined this thing with texture, how do I actually close the gap between here and there? As opposed to incremental change, which is valuable and necessary in times of trauma. If we don't act immediately, it's gone. But I'm talking about a rhythm between the two. Does that make sense? And then we'll break, because that was a good segue into the next. First, thanks for your thoughts on the social entrepreneurship piece, because I think that that gets a little testy and fun. I love what you had to say. I could um, say I a lot more about that, too. Push back into the um, imagination piece mm -hmm. and the idea of imagination. I don't know if you would call it a skill, but it feels like the way that you were talking about this ability to recall, this ability to bring it on board. Um, it's frightening when you go out in the world and realize that has been snuffed out in a lot of people. And so 
kind of thinking Absolutely. about people at the age of you know 44 and 50 and people at the age of nine mm -hmm. who you know in that space in between where imagination is actually something that's not really plastic with them anymore so what do we what do we do with that and part of the reason why this came out as a single is if we believe this and if we can get from beyond imagination just for artists and really understand that it's a necessity, necessary commodity, capacity, propensity even, <coughs> disposition in today's world, then we have to reform education with that in mind. But one of the parts in the pragmatic imagination is just how do people set themselves in motion? And this is something, this is what I've been doing all my life as I teach, is how do I take kids who have supplanted the visual parts of the brain with the numeric and, and sheaf of language part of their brain. We, I was just at CASBIS. We did an amazing summer, summit there at Stanford. And they went on and on about you know, literacy and, and the literacies of the future. And I'm saying, you're only talking about reading. Where, where's social and visual in this, right? Those are more critical today than, I mean, reading I love. I love, I and mean, people aren't reading enough. But so um, I think we need to, but anyway, so I was, I was diverging. Uh, so there's one little section on setting the imagination in motion. So how do you get started? Everything from um, uh, uh, evocative objects to precedents to uh, games. There's lots of things that people over time have done to set themselves in motion.